who looks at their report by looking at the sales spreadsheet gets one number. Maybe the shipping manager who looks at the order reports gets a different number. All right. And finally, the overall manager who maybe looks at the customer's report gets a, a third number still. Well, how are you going to manage a business that way when you, when you don't have a good feel for accurate numbers and, and each area is making decisions based on different raw data? It's not going to work. So what does redundancy do? Or rather, eliminating redundancy do? That means that the sales numbers only live in one place. All right? So, if I want to see the sales tallied by order because I'm the shipping manager, it pulls from the same data as if I'm the sales rep and I want to see how my sales reps are doing, if I'm the sales manager rather, and I want to see how my sales reps are doing, or if I'm the CEO and I'm looking at it from a customer perspective. Now, in order to do that, I better be able to take that data and produce it in multiple different ways. All right? Be able, better be able to show sales order by order, show sales customer by customer, show sales sales rep by sales rep. All right? But if it's not redundant data, we have a fighting chance of it being accurate. Right? doesn't guarantee accuracy. Nothing we can do can guarantee accuracy. But we can prevent some specific problems from happening. And one of those specific problems is inconsistency. All right. So by having data not stored in a redundant way, we make sure, at the very least, we don't guarantee it's accurate, but if it's wrong, we only have to fix it in one place. If, the, if an order got keyed in different, uh, incorrectly, and it said that this customer bought $5 worth of goods, and they actually bought 500 we only need to correct it in one place, and everyone's information will come out corrected. All right. What else do we know about databases? What else is, is, do we know about databases in general terms? What do we store in databases? I'll say it so no one else will. We store data. Course, but be a little more descriptive. Tables. tables. In databases, we have tables. What is a table? What do we mean when we say a table? What does a table represent? Is it like a, uh, a group of specific facts? Okay, a group of specific facts, that's true. In, in, in database-ish terms, it's, it's all data about one entity. And what do we mean by an entity? Well, that again is getting back to our problem domain. All right? You can think of the, the, the entities as being sort of actors in the problem domain. By actors, I don't mean like, you know, um, Tom Cruise. I mean actors like participants in the problem domain. And they can be, you know, something tangible or they can be something intangible. For example, you know, a student is an entity in an academic environment. A professor is an entity in an academic environment. A credit hour is an entity, all right, I suppose. Um, maybe that's not such a good one. A, a course is a, a course distinct from a section of a course is an entity, right? In other words, CISS 243, whether you're taking it this semester or next semester, there's some things in common, there's some characteristics about it, all right? So it could be like an abstract entity. In other words, you can't go somewhere and point at, here is CISS 243. You can maybe point to the section, but again, even that's kind of kind of iffy. So it might be real entities, and it might be more abstract entities. Now, as we said before, the entities in a problem domain tend to stay the same over time. This is all the whole puzzling discussion at the beginning of class of imagining what you'd see if you came back here in 1959, 
you know, you see the greased back hair and you'd see the poodle skirts and you'd see all that. Yeah, that's true. But at the root of it, you'd see students, you'd see professors, you'd see classes, you'd see buildings, you'd see rooms, you'd see courses going on. You would see, if you stayed long enough, students getting degrees at the, at the end of the semester and, and so on and so forth. All right. So the entities of a problem domain are fairly stable. But the trick is, is you've got to make sure you've identified all the entities. Because some entities are less obvious. And sometimes you can have one entity that's really disguising two entities. Two entities will be disguised as one entity. All right? And, and more about that later. What else do we have in databases besides the entities? Relationships. Now, we talked about redundancy and we talked about not wanting to have three different spreadsheets that say, here is the sales numbers by order, here is the sales numbers by customer, here are the sales numbers by sales rep. All right. But yeah, we know that, hey, someone is interested in looking at the, the sales uh, numbers grouped by sales rep. And maybe another person is interested in looking at the sales numbers grouped by customer. So we want flexibility. Therefore, among all these entities, they have to be hooked together so that we can like, get there from here, you know, as they say. How do you get there from here? How do you get from customer to sales orders? How do you get from sales rep to sales orders? All right. We can do that. We can provide that flexibility provided the proper relationships are created. All right. So by creating relationships between these entities, we don't have to store the data in multiple places because it's connected. We know that between the sales rep and the orders, there's some relationship. We know that between customer and order, there's some relationship. They're connected somehow. Well, in addition to storing the data, the raw facts, in these tables, those tables are connected together, and they're connected via relationships. All right? The other thing that we're going we're gonna to add to this, um, we're not done talking about relationships by any means. Um, Sometimes I you talk about relationships so much in these classes, I feel like Dr. Phil. But the, the other thing that we're going to talk about now before we look at a more concrete example is to talk about um, attributes. And attributes are the individual fields of data that we're going to, we're going to store about an entity. So, if we talk about a customer, um, some of the attributes might be the name of the customer, the address of the customer, city, state, and zip, the telephone number, the email address, and so on. If we talk about a sales rep, it might be the sales rep's name, it might be their address, it might be the sales region that they cover, and so on down the line. All right? So there's attributes about each of the entities. Now, attributes come into play for relationships as well. How do attributes come into play with relationships? Can anyone give an example of that? What do attributes have to do with relationships? One, one instance of an entity mm -hmm. to, to another. Right. In other words, how do we relate one table to another? They have an attribute in common. All right. So, for example, maybe an order, all right, has a customer number, and the customer, of course, has a customer number. 
And that's how we have a relationship between the order table and the customer table, because they both have a customer number in them. And the customer number of the order points to the customer in the customer table. Now, it gets a little more involved than that, but that's, I guess, a good, quick description of, of that sort of thing. So let's go and let's look at a, at a concrete example, all right? And let, let's, let's talk about the one that we're, we're describing where we have orders and for simplicity we'll say we only have one product, right, that they, that they can order, all right? So we won't talk about multiple products because that, that'll just, for now, that'll muddy the water. So let's say we have orders that our customers place, our sales reps sell, our customers place the orders, and they order a certain quantity of some product. All right. So in this example, all right, we have orders. sales reps, and customers. There's a lot of ways that you can design databases. There's a, lot of strategy, there's a couple strategies that you can take for designing databases. Uh, the, uh, typically they call the top down or the bottom up. The bottom up is where you think of everything that you need to store, then sort of like work on grouping that together. Uh, into entities and then developing the relationships. I typically don't do it that way. I typically think from the top down. All right. When you think of the top down, your when you think from the top down, your first task is to identify the entities. So, in our hypothetical situation of of an organization that has orders that customers place that place with their sales rep, um, we have three entities. We have sales rep, we have orders, and we have customers. All right? So that's our first job. All right? Now, what are the relationships between these entities? Well, I'm going to make some assumptions, and we'll talk about those assumptions in a minute. I'm going to make the assumption that a customer places orders, which is probably a pretty good assumption, right? And that associated with each order, is the sales rep that took that order. So I define uh, a relationship between these two. All right. So I've developed the relationships between this. Sort of. We'll talk more about the relationships in a minute. All right. Now let's think of attributes. And we talked about this. We said for sales rep, there'd be name, address, city, state, and zip. That will be enough for now. For customers, there's also the customer name, address, city, city, state, and zip. Now for the orders, it's probably going to be something like an order number, the date that the order was placed, the amount of the order. Remember we said there's only one product. All right. There's someone looking in here with a clipboard. You went away, Adam? Yeah, they, 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 they turned. Uh, they, they turned. They were looking in here at first. So, excellent. <laughs> I'm out. And we mentioned that we have to somehow connect the orders to the sales rep and the orders to the customer. And what we said is we're going to do that by defining, uh, by, by having an attribute in common. So, I could, almost any time I say I could, is going to be a bad idea. Just, just, you know, just as a tip off. I could put the sales rep's name in here and the customer name here. And then my tables have attributes in common, so I've created a relationship. I have a relationship between sales rep and sales rep because they have a name in common to the sales rep. 
I have a relationship between the orders and the customer because I have the name of the customer in there. Why is that not a good idea? It's not really redundancy. No. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you why. Because these are actually, one second, these are actually two pieces of information. One piece of information is that this customer's name is Fred. In the order table, if I say customer name, all right, I'm not saying that this customer's name is Fred. I'm saying that the customer associated with this order is Fred. That's two different pieces of, of, of information, two different pieces of data. One is that there's a customer named Fred who lives at this address or whose office is at this address. Another one says for order number one, two, three, the customer that placed the order is Fred. So that's not really redundant. That, that's, otherwise, how would we know which customer placed the order? We'd have 50 customers out here. We don't know which one placed it. So that's not really redundancy because we need to somehow connect those together. So it's true to say that this really is a different piece of information because we're not simply saying that there's a customer named Fred out there. We're saying that the customer named Fred is, in fact, the one customer that placed this order. All right. What was your they reasoning? They could uh, switch the uh, salesperson in between the sales, or they could have uh, the same customer with two different salesmen. Sometimes that happens. I don't know if that's a problem. Depends how we define, depends how the, the sales organization works. Yeah. All right, so that's probably not a problem. You could have two customers named Fred. You could have two friends, right? You have two friends the scheme tumbles down, right? Because we have Fred in here, all right, as a customer name. Is it the Fred that lives in Lorraine or the Fred that lives in Elyria? We don't know. So how then do we get a report that lists, hey, you know, Fred and Lorraine purchased $200 worth of stuff or Fred and Elyria purchased $500 worth of stuff? We don't, all right? So name is probably not a good idea to link these two together. All right. Why not? Because it could be duplicates. And the same thing with the with the sales rep. We could have John Doe and John Doe. All right. So that if we have the sales rep name, that isn't enough information. Who gets the commission check then? Now we have something like this at school, right? There's something at school that makes sure that you don't get someone else's bill, even if they have the same name as you. All right. And you don't get their grades even though they have the same name as you. And your stuff doesn't appear on a transcript uh, with the same person that has the same name as you. Your stuff appears on your transcript. Their stuff appears on theirs. What mechanism do we have that keeps that sort of thing from happening? Your student ID number. All right. So guess what? We can't make sure that we only have one customer named Fred, right? You know, can you imagine, we have already, you know, someone calls in to place an order and they say, I'm sorry, we already have a Fred. Or a sales rep comes in, sorry, we already have a John Doe. You know, you're the best sales rep in the world, but we can't hire you because we already have a John Doe. Or even worse, to the original John Doe, sorry, there's a better John Doe that came to work for our organization, you're fired, all right? So no, what do, they, what, what do we do instead? We put in some sort of ID number that we guarantee is unique. Then there's no worries, because we're not going to run out of numbers. Right? Another customer comes in, they just get the next number down the line. Another sales rep comes in, doesn't matter what their name is, they just get the next number down the line. And then we use that to link our tables together. So, maybe Lorraine Fred is number one, Elyria Fred is number five. Doesn't matter what their what their names are. If it's Lorraine Fred, there's a one in that field. If there's if it's Elyria Fred, there's a five in there. Now, 
What do we call fields like this sales rep ID? This is obviously a special field. All right? It's a special field, right? Because it has to be unique, right? We already said name can't be unique, right? Because there could be two people that have the same name or not going to throw away business just because we already have someone with that name. Can't make address unique, right? You know, two people living in the same house might want to be different customers. You might build to a different credit card number, you know. Um, so can't make the, you know, the, uh, the address isn't going to be unique. But we've said no matter what, this has to be unique, right? Because we have to be able to absolutely be sure that this order points to only one customer. So what do we call customer ID? Primary key. Primary key. All right. How do we define primary key? We define it a couple different ways. First of all, every table should have one. All right. Secondly, it must be unique. That is, there cannot be two members, two rows in that table, or two members of that entity that have the same value for the primary key. So there can't be two customer ones just like there can't be another student on campus that has the same ID as you. Every customer has to have one. So there's no customer like with a blank customer number. Just like no student could enroll without first getting assigned a student number. So, every member has to have one and it has to be unique. Same idea with sales rep here. And same idea with order number here. Now, the only way that we're going to relate tables together is by having the primary key of one table as an attribute in another table. It's the only way we are ever going to relate tables together. We are never, for example, going to have the customer name in the order table. That's what would be redundant if we had the customer name along with the customer ID. That would be a redundancy because we know if it's customer one, it's Lorraine Fred. All right? If it's customer five, it's Elyria Fred. So we don't need the name of the customer. We do need to know which customer it is. And we do that through the primary key of one table being the attribute in another table. That's the only way we're ever going to link tables together. Never going to put another attribute in common to link tables together. And if you think about it, that's a good thing because that's the one field that we're guaranteed to be unique. So there's not going to be any ambiguity about what sales rep does this belong to. Well, the sales rep ID can only point to one sales rep. This customer number can only point to one customer. Because by definition, there's never going to be two customers that have the same customer ID. And never going to be two sales reps that have the same sales rep ID. Make sense? Now, there's one more thing that we're going to do all right, to this. To tighten things up even further. Right? Think about if I was doing this with spreadsheets. If I was doing this with spreadsheets, I could have in spreadsheet one, let's say, and remember with these spreadsheets, they're each standalone and there's no linking between them. So I could have in the, the order spreadsheet that customer 519 purchased uh, $50 worth of materials on October 16th, and it's order number 123. Now, interestingly enough, because each spreadsheet sort of a standalone thing, there might not be a customer 519, or whatever number I said. We'll have to roll the tape back to, to see what I said, but I think I said 519. So there might not be a customer 519 in the customer file, all right? What happens then? Chaos happens then. Because either that information didn't get recorded in the sales order table correctly, 
or it got credited to the wrong customer. All right. In which case, again, you run the risk of data that is inconsistent. In other words, if I ran a report sorted by customer, I'd get different results than if I look at the customer spreadsheet, which is not a good thing. So, let's say I only have sales rep one and two. is either one or two, right? Because that's my only two sales reps. And assuming, of course, that there has to be a sales rep associated with this, all right? If I'm allowed to put into this table, I have an order. And the sales rep that took the order is sales rep three. I got a problem, right? Because that order isn't associated with the sales rep. So in other words, if I ran a report by sales rep, it would show totals for each sales rep. Let's say Mike sold 100, Emily sold 200. So if I ran a report that totaled up the orders for these two sales reps, it would say $300 worth of orders. Guess what? That $1,000 order is missing here because there's no sales rep three. So there's no way of associating that order with the sales rep. So we might, depending again on the queries and all that, we might miss that and have an inconsistency. And who do we write the commission check to? All right, someone's going to be annoyed, right? Whoever should have gotten that order. So how do we fix this? How do we fix, we, we, we fixed one problem, the problem of having duplicate names by using an ID number that we can guarantee that it's unique. How do we fix this problem, whereas you can put in a number that doesn't exist in that table? Can you fix that? I, I hope so. Constraints. Pardon me? Constraints? Is that the what kind of constraints? That there's a role that that number has to be a number okay. that's in that table. You're absolutely right. In general, these things are called constraints, database constraints. And you can make a constraint that says, hey, the sales rep in this table has to match one of the sales reps in this table. All right? I can define a constraint that says, this sales rep has to match up with one of the sales reps over here. All right? What is that specific kind of constraint called? There's a special name for that kind of constraint. Anyone recall it? That is called a foreign key constraint. In other words, in the order table, the, foreign, the uh, sales rep is a foreign key to the sales rep table. What does that mean? It means that I can put a constraint in that says that, hey, I'm not going to allow putting in a sales rep with a number of three if my only two sales reps are one and two. You don't get foreign keys automatically. Uh, in other words, just because it's called sales rep ID here and sales rep ID there, that doesn't mean anything. Right? It doesn't know to associate those. All right? Which is a good thing, right? Because we can have state in a bunch of tables. And, and 
so therefore it is best if the database doesn't assume 